Uh, just remind you of where we are here. This is important to identify who a racist or a dangerous racist would be. Race leaders, I think, they're race destroyers. One, they see groups and not individuals. One race is always right, one race is always wrong. Um, the second one is there's no objectivity. In other words, facts doesn't, they just doesn't matter. You can go to a court, you can prove it with science, it doesn't matter to them. And the third is power through conflict and division. They gain their power and they're always stirring the pot because that's how they gain their power. When you have those three things, you can have a dangerous situation. But those three things really play into what I would call the cycle of hate. And I want to just touch on them here and we'll come back to them in a second. But the first one is an event. And I'll give you the Treaty of Versailles or slavery in America. I'll give this, uh, this cycle to you here in a minute through the 1930s. An event, then somebody plants the seeds of discord. And then the third one is a crisis. And then that leads to a race war or race conflict. Okay. So let's look. The best example of this is Adolf Hitler. Here's a leader who literally mechanized the extermination of an entire people and then passed it on to the Middle East. It was racism at an unprecedented scale. How could any country in Europe allow such a brutish and racist man to come to power? Well, the cycle of hate explains it. They would have said, really, the Nazis would have said, that it was um, the superhuman qualities of their leader, Adolf Hitler. But the true reason for the rise of the Nazi power is not that simple. It's much more alarming if you look at our criteria. Nazism, which was created in the Second World War, just after, was born really out of the first through socialism. On November 11th, 1918, to the surprise of the German frontline troops, the war suddenly just stopped and the Germans were furious and they wondered why the armistice ended so quickly. The myth grew that the German soldiers had been stabbed in the back and they saw two million of their own men dead, betrayed by who they say were Marxist Jews. They believed that uh, they had uh, fomented dissent back home. And as they came back to Germany, they took their bitterness with them. And the bitterness blossomed because there was something else. The United States and the League of Nations getting together through the Treaty of Versailles, punishing Germans. Well, they saw those people at the Treaty of Versailles as well as Jews. And the Jews became convenient scapegoats. And they were held to blame for all of the country's problems. Everyone's family was suffering. Millions of Germans were hungry and thousands more were dying from disease. Radicals rose from the crisis. The open fighting in the streets of Munich, 1919. Germany was in full-fledged crisis and there was a left-wing takeover of the city that culminated with the Munich Soviet Republic. The Soviets, the communists, they attempted to create a Soviet city. The majority of Germans began to feel that um, Bolsheviks were the problem, and that Bolshevis, uh, Bolshevism and Judaism were the same, two great evils. And so the anti-Jewish sentiment came back and it was widespread. And in bad times, people start to turn to anyone who says they have an answer, especially if it blames it on another group. Brutality becomes respected. The German Captain Ernst Rohn said, Since I am uh, immature and a wicked man, war and unrest appeal to me more than um, good bourgeois order. Brutality is respected. The people need some wholesome fear. They want to fear something. They want something to frighten them and make them uh, stutteringly submissive. Well, he joined the Germans, Germans Workers' Party. That's where he met Adolf Hitler, who shared many of those same beliefs and the hatred of Jews. Hitler had one natural talent, and that was that. He could, he could channel people's hatred and his hatred and anger at the way the war had ended, and he channeled it into very powerful speeches. The iniquity of the Versailles Treaty were, was where Germany lost a, a ton of territory and they were forced to pray, pay reparations and they blamed the Jews again. But as with any racist, according to our first point, 
whether or not the communist Jews in Russia were different than the Jews all across Europe, irrelevant to them. It didn't matter. Individuals don't count with racists. Groups do. So one Jew in Russia and one Jew in America is the same. Hitler and the Nazis didn't make any distinction between the Jews rioting in the East. All the Jews were evil. All of them, uh, towards the end of the war, had to be killed, according to the Nazis. Criteria number two, they have no uh, objectivity. The facts just don't matter. Whether or not you were responsible for Germany's dire situation or you were in the war fighting for the German side, doesn't matter. You're a Jew. That's it. And therefore, you're unfit for life. Lastly, the third criteria for a racist, Hitler sought power so he could divide the continent and conquer and create the greatest empire the world had ever seen, or so he thought. Not only did he use the suffering of others to advance himself politically, he tried to kill off an entire race to take over the world. That's the consummate example of one of the worst racists the world has ever seen. The next state, uh, case study is Louis Farrakhan. Farrakhan was born in the Bronx, very different, very aware of the plight of black people given to him from his mom. She exposed her son to progressive material from an early age, having them attend the NAACP meetings, and Farrakhan had dreams of being a calypso singer and a dancer, but soon he met Malcolm X and was encouraged to join the Nation of Islam instead. He didn't believe in Calypso all of a sudden. 1955, he took the name Louis X. Because of his mom, Farrakhan was very aware of the plight of the African American, and he, like Hitler, blamed the Jews now for all of his troubles. Not any particular individual, but just the Jews. He called the Jewish religion a gutter religion. In fact, he said this about them as well. You are not real Jews, those of you that are not real Jews. You are the synagogue of Satan. And you have wrapped your tentacles around the U.S. government. And you are deceiving and sending this nation to hell. Okay. He also expressed his admiration for Hitler and his ability to have such a profound effect on Jews. Um, and by that he meant their extermination. Watch this. When I speak very clear, if I say the man was wicked, but he was so great that you're still talking about him 50 years later? If he didn't make an impact on Jewish people and an impact on the world, why are you still referring to him? Why are you still making movies about him? Why are you still teaching the world what he did? Okay. Our second criteria is Farrakhan objective. Would you want him on your jury? Perhaps if your name was Trayvon Martin, maybe. But I think it's safe to say that he's not objective. Objectivity doesn't play a big role in how he approaches anything. Farrakhan is the master of division. Through his speech, through his religious stances, uh, through everything he does. And the third one is David Duke. David Duke, and I'm running out of time, but I'm going to keep it short. How do we know he's a racist? Well, he refers to the term racial re realist is what he calls himself, but he was a former Grand Wizard and Ku Klux Klan member, so I think the white hood kind of speaks for itself. But um, let's try to stay scholarly here and go through the paradigm. Does David Duke see groups or individuals? He sees groups. Anyone who believes all whites are superior to all blacks is not looking at the content of the character. Is he objective? If I were black and found out if David Duke was judging my case and he was in the jury box, I think I'd run for the hills. And lastly, does he divide for power? Well, I, I think when he wore the Nazi uniform to school in Louisiana State University, I don't think there was any Jews on campus who were asking him to go out for a cup of coffee and let's talk things over. Same thing when he sent out invitations for his annual birthday party for Hitler. Whether this gained him any power is unclear, but he tried. He ran for four positions in government and lost before fleeing to the mountains of Austria, another very racist part of the world. So let's go back to the cycle of hate and you tell me where we are. If I look at this as America, the event, which was real, was not the Treaty of Versailles for us. It was slavery. That's what it was. Now the second step in this cycle is people that will plant the seeds of discord. They will never let any wound heal. They're always 
picking and picking and picking and dividing the whole time, blaming every problem you have on somebody else. And then the third one is a crisis. In Germany, it was an economic crisis. In America, I think it will be an economic crisis as well, but it doesn't have to be, but a real crisis, and people get hungry. And then the fourth step is war. You tell me where we are on the cycle of hate, and you judge for yourself, because now you know the anatomy of a racist.